Good morning. We're going to have uh, Dr. Donahue give us a talk this morning on uh, PJK and deformity. Um, it's a topic that we don't have answers to, but certainly all need to be educated better on. So uh, Scott's one of our Navy residents, and it's, uh, so happy to have you with us, Scott. And why don't you take it from here? Hey, thanks, Dr. Mundus. Thank you. Thank you all for having me again. As you said, Scott Donahue from Navy. I'll be talking about proximal junctional kyphosis today. I have uh, no conflicts of interest or uh, disclosures regarding this lecture. I have my little uh, government disclosure down on the bottom. And uh, this will be the outline for my talk today. I don't know if uh, my video is on, but I guess that's all right. So first of all, just to define adult spinal deformity before we go into proximal junctional kyphosis. So spinal alignment that occurs in the malalignment that occurs in the coronal, sagittal, or axial planes. The etiology usually fall into two, two main buckets, either residual slash idiopathic or degenerative in nature. And then how we address adult spinal deformity uh, surgically is with typically multi-level fusion constructs with or without uh, osteotomies. So then what is pro proximal junctional kyphosis? So this is the development of uh, a, kypho a ky kyphotic deformity at the transition of the uh, fused or unfused vertebrae. So in a broader sense, PJK is a form of adjacent segment pathology that's seen after spinal fusion in either correcting a uh, scoliosis or kyphosis or other uh, deformity it doesn't only occur in the adult population, but given this is a, a pretty broad topic, I, I focus this talk more on the adult subject. Um, so there, there is a kyphotic change in the disc space above the fusion um, in adults, uh, fractures, subluxations, and a long sweeping uh, kyphosis above the fusion also occur. So th this is a review article that came out of the uh, Asian Spine Journal. It was published out of Korea in 2016. This just shows that there are various definitions of PJK that have been described in the literature. Uh, this, this table shows uh, four specific uh, definitions that have been described. Um, so although there's not a clear definition, it seems that reviewing the literature, the most commonly accepted and the most cited um, definition comes from the Glatz et al. paper in 2005. And their de definition is a proximal junctional sagittal cob angle greater than or equal to 10 degrees and at least 10 degrees greater than the preoperative measurement. So in the Glatz paper, they looked at 81 adult patients that were treated with long segmental instrumented posterior fusion. Uh, they did see an incidence of uh, about 26% in their, in their study. They looked at, they also looked at outcomes in their paper, uh, SRS 24 outcomes. They weren't significantly different in the, um, the patients with PJK and uh, those, those without. So they're, they, uh, did see that PJK was most common when stopping at the T3 level. So there's a high incidence of PJK, uh, but the outcome scores weren't necessarily significant in these patients, which we'll get into a little more later. A little more on incidence. Uh, so the reported incidence does vary in the literature. It also depends on which definition you apply to PJK. Uh, the, the ranges of incidence go from 17 up to even 62%. I'd say most sources cite about 20 to 40% uh, postoperative incidence. Uh, Kim et al. reported an incidence of 39%. They had a 7.8-year uh, follow-up. Uh, but as far as timing goes postoperatively, it, uh, PJK tends to, to occur pretty frequently uh, after uh, recently after surgery, uh, Yagi et al. reported a 66% of the PJKs seen in their study occurred within three months after surgery. 
And then Wang et al. reported occurrence of 80% occurred within 18 months after surgery. Just a little more on incidence and risk factors. Uh, this, this cohort, this is a 2018 study by Sabali et al. And they, they noted a incidence of 25% in their study. And then some of the risk factors they, they noted were age greater than 50 uh, was statistically significant and had a positive correlation and also BMI over 25. They noted that uh, higher preoperative pelvic tilt uh, had a positive correlation with PJK occurrence. And in this study, they noted revision for PJK occurred in 2.3% of the patients, and it accounted for 15% uh, of all the revisions that they, they saw in this, in this study. Uh, a a meta-analysis that was published in the European literature in 2016 on incidents looked at 14 studies. So they had a total of 2,215 patients they looked at, and they identified the risk factors of age over 55, uh, taking the fusion construct down to S1, uh, a preoperative kyphotic angle in the thoracic spine greater than 40 degrees, also low bone mineral density, and then an SVA difference greater than five centimeters. So when we look at the, moving on to etiology of proximal junctional kyphosis, we could kind of put this into three different uh, categories, being radiographic findings, uh, patient related, and then surgical risk factors, which, which lead to PJK. So looking at radiographic factors preoperatively, uh, as I've kind of mentioned previously, looking at the sagittal malalignment preoperatively, so a high preoperative SVA, and also the presence of thoracic kyphosis, and then a preoperative uh, proximal junctional angle greater than five degrees can be predictive. Um, and then patient factors. So I've, I've mentioned age, BMI, also, osteoporosis um, can, tends to be, uh, it, it's intuitive to think that osteoporosis contributes to PJK as, you know, instrumentation at that level uh, can lead to fracture, can lead to um, pullout of, of the instrumentation. Also, smoking has been identified and other uh, medical comorbidities as we, um, you know, just went through our, our conference, our multidisciplinary conference, identifying, um, you know, different comorbidities in our patients, which can contribute to, to complications after, after these surgeries. There's also surgical factors that have been identified, uh, approach related. So looking at specifically disruption of the posterior soft tissue, so the posterior tension band consists of the supraspinous and the interspinous ligaments, uh, and then also the intervertebral elements as, such as the facet capsule. So there's been cadaveric and biomechanical data that has supported these claims that disruption of, um, of the posterior soft tissue at the proximal level can, um, can contribute. Also uh, combined anterior and posterior approach there's literature to support that PJK is three times more likely to develop uh, compared to a posterior only approach. Also anterior only approach has been implicated. Uh, looking at the construct rigidity, so increasing the stiffness of the pedicle screws, uh, extension of the fusion down to the sacral pelvis, and then a choice of upper instrumented vertebrae is important as well as, as the, um, that can contribute a greater SVA correction, which there, there has been literature to support uh, advocating for age-related correction. So some of the older patients don't necessarily need correction uh, to zero. So you can, um, you know, consider the age of your patient and uh, determine that, you know, a, um, milder correction may be, may be needed in those patients to help prevent complications and also increasing postoperative lumbar lordosis. So what are the clinical implications? So I think historically, you know, dating back to, you know, probably before the early 2000s, 
uh, when we started to pay more attention to PJK, uh, this was initially just thought to be a simple radiographic finding that had few clinical consequences. But now uh, there's been more and more studies published on this topic that have uh, come out in the literature more recently through the through the 2000s. And uh, we find that this is more a spectrum of disease with, um, with these patients. And there's and not only do they, they have increased pain levels, they're also having, these patients are having worse clinical outcomes. Um, so then PJK can lead to proximal junctional failure. So what's the significance? P proximal junctional failure actually includes when these patients become symptomatic, they have increasing pain, they have disturbances with walking, neurologic deficits, they have inability to maintain a horizontal gaze, and this is what leads to reoperation. Uh, I think it's also important to differentiate proximal junctional kyphosis from proximal junctional failure when they look at these at, at these patients when they present and we see, uh, you know, a radiograph showing proximal junctional kyphosis. I think we need to quantify their their symptoms and if this is affecting their quality of life. So additionally, you know, if we need to revise the, these patients, revision surgeries, subject the, the patient to increased risk of perioperative complications, uh, revision surgery can have also significant economic implications, not only implications on the patient. Uh, in 2008, Hart et al. estimated the cost of uh, revision spine surgery at 77,000, and this is 14 years ago. So we know that the costs have significantly increased in the setting of, of our inflation and increasing medical costs. Looking at uh, pain scores and a little more on clinical implications, this study uh, was by Kim et al. Uh, in 2013 in spine uh, with uh, coming out of Wash U and HSS showing the implications of pain. So they, they found that the cohort that had PJK did have a statistically significant more pain with 29.4% uh, of patients in the PJK group reporting pain through their Scoliosis Research Society scores. And then only 0.9% of patients in the non-PJK PJK group uh, were showing uh, pain scores that were statistically significant. So moving on to classification. So there's been a couple, there's a main classification system that's been proposed. Uh, this classification system with, was proposed by Yagi et al. And they initially proposed a classification system in 2019 uh, that was uh, this described type, uh, type one, two, or three, whether there's disc and ligamentous failure, uh, two being bone failure, and three being implant bone interface failure, and then grade uh, being increasing levels of uh, kyphotic angle. And then in 2014, they uh, published again the, the, same, the same group, and they just modified uh, the classification system to add in spondylolisthesis, whether or not that is present or not. And they did find that failures with neurologic abnormalities were more likely to have spondylolisthesis, which is the main reason that they added that to the classification system. And then it, also in 2014, another uh, paper published in Spine by the Adult Spinal Deformity Committee with um, Hart et al., they looked at, they attempted to try to um, provide a classification system to help guide management. Uh, so they, they provided a way to assess severity score and it, it encompassed uh, six different factors. They looked at neurologic deficits, focal pain, instrumentation problems, change in kyphosis, PCL integrity, whether there was a fracture at the upper instrument and vertebrae or the uh, the caudal vertebrae above the UIV, and then they looked at also the level of the UIV. So how do we how do we prevent uh, PJK? And this is uh, you know 
there's been several studies in the literature looking at uh, different modalities to help prevent it. Some of these include osteoporosis, identification and treatment, uh, consideration of cement augmentation and vertebroplasty, uh, instrumentation considerations, rather than just using pedicle screws, do we use hooks? And then, as I previously mentioned, uh, considering age-adjusted deformity correction. So just doing a little deeper dive into the literature on, on prevention, uh, we had a nice talk on uh, osteoporosis evaluation and treatment last week, um, but so I won't go uh, too deep in, into this topic, but uh, the gold standard does remain DEXA scan, but just to mention uh, there's, there's been several studies in which authors are, are describing the utilization of CT scan and Hounsfield units to identify our patients preoperatively because most of our, excuse me, most of our patients are going to have a preoperative CT scan as we're planning. Uh, so this study specifically out of the European literature, they looked at assessing the S1 vertebral body in both the sagittal axial planes and providing a Hounsfield unit cutoff for helping to diagnose uh, osteoporosis preoperatively. So when we do identify osteoporosis, either through DEXA scan or our CT scan, what's the best modality to treat it? Uh, this uh, Yagi looked at uh, in their group, this study came out of Japan in 2016, and they looked at specifically uh, preventing type two failure, which again, reminder is the bony failure. And they looked specifically at ter teriparatide or Forteo treatment after surgery to correct spinal deformity. So they had uh, 43 female patients um, after surgery who received teriparatide versus 33 controls. And they looked at the incidence of of type two uh, failure. And they showed that there was a significant decrease in failure with the teriparatide group um, having a 4.6% incidence versus the control group that had a 15.2% uh, incidence of failure. So they advocated for prophylactic teriparatide treatment um, to help prevent uh, failure at the upper instrument of vertebrae and uh, plus one level Considering prophylactic vertebral cement augmentation, uh, the study uh, came out of uh, the Spine Journal. Study, this group came, was in Miami, published in 2017. They looked at prophylactic vertebroplasty using PMMA, and they looked at 38 patients, uh, and they, they did vertebroplasty at the, at the plus one and the UIV level. They did a retrospective review and they did find, um, they found a significant de decrease in um, proximal uh, kyphotic angle with 10 versus 6.8. And this was found to be uh, statistically significant. So uh, there, they concluded that prophylactic vertebral cement augmentation at the UIV um, is at the time of deformity correction does appear to be preventative in helping prevent the development of PJK and failure. Uh, I think that there, I did review some case reports also that do show increasing complexity of revision surgery. These still do fail and um, having the cement in the vertebral body does create um, a more complex revision surgery. So I think that's the other side of the argument for um, with, with this, this paper that that should be considered if you if you uh, perform a vertebroplasty. Just looking at construct choice, um, this, the group, uh, this uh, 2013, um, they looked at transverse process hook and pedicle versus pedicle screws at the UIV in patients who are undergoing more than five levels of instrumentation. They did a two-year follow-up and they did not see any incidents of uh, PJK in their, uh, in their group with hooks. And they saw, it's a rather small cohort of just 20 patients, but then uh, their control group uh, utilizing pedicle screws had a 29% incidence of, of uh, PJK. So 
they concluded that transverse process hooks were associated with lower incidence of PJK. And then uh, one study in the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis group, also uh, the, the bottom study here looked at 410 patients and they divided the cohorts into three groups with hook only constructs, hybrid constructs and pedicle screw instrumentation. And they did see the lowest incidence of PJK in the hook only construct group. So when do we intervene with these patients? Um, as, as I previously mentioned, the, you know, we need to assess the patient, just the, the mere presence of, of um, kyphosis at the proximal junction is not an indication for revision. So we will assess our patients in clinic, uh, determine if they're symptomatic uh, before making a decision on management and uh, revision. And uh, a final study I looked at here, uh, a cohort of 57 patients that was uh, retrospectively reviewed and they evaluated with factors associated with revision surgery. They did find that that traumatic etiology uh, was one of the significant modes of failure that was associated with revision. Uh, they also did a logistic regression analysis and found that factors that influence re, uh, revision were analyzed. And they found that in this study, they found combined anterior and posterior approach at in index surgery was significant and more extreme proximal junctional kyphosis angle was also significant. So in conclusion, uh, proximal junctional kyphosis is a common complication following adult uh, spinal deformity correction. Uh, PJK etiology is multifactorial. Uh, risk factors have been identified in numerous studies. So I think having surgeon awareness of risk factors and attempting to modify those risk factors help may help aid in um, our patients developing PJK postoperatively. So this is uh, I'm prior Army and uh, now Navy. So Army Navy Day is a is a win win for me, and this is my uh, favorite favorite retractor here. And uh, I I appreciate all your attention, and thank you for having me and and the residents from Navy here at the uh, Spine Foundation. We really appreciate it. And I'll open the floor to any uh, comments or, or questions. And these are my references. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Great job, Scott. Tough topic. Sure. Um, so, Cody and Micah, what do you guys think of age adjusted alignment? And Ben. Since you asked, Dr. Mondes, I think it's uh, terrible, and we should uh, should not not uh, even consider it. <laughs> and actually, what does what does Cody Barrett think? <laughs> yeah. uh, I I think it's it's reasonable to account for age in a parameter that seems to change uh, with age, but I don't know that the like amount that it's being accounted for is. Uh, reasonable like I, I think it probably does change but i don't think it changes to the extent that it's being factored in in the age adjusted formulas yeah my other concern with all that thought process is that it's changing in a flexible spine and that's very different than a rigid spine and where patients may be able to accommodate throughout all their open disc spaces and facet joints you know to put someone in a sagittal malaligned position um, um, with it all being fused may may not be the right thing. I, I don't think we totally know the answer to that, but I I always caution towards you know the dogma of you know everything is one way or the other. You know, I I think it more highlights the fact we don't entirely understand understand it, you know. Um, certainly, if you take a Parkinson's patient and you make them perfectly straight up and down, they'll probably fail because they can't see the floor, right? And so those patients need to be able to have some grasp of where the floor is, you know, relative to other older adults that, you know, may be fine just looking forward because their proprioception is okay. Um, so I, I don't think we totally understand it. Is that true that uh, 
all these age adjusted uh, studies are considering uh, chronological age versus a true physiologic age of, of a 60 year old is, you know, they're not the same. Oh, agree. Is that yeah. very true? It does not, it only does chronologic age. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing in pediatrics. They, they use chronological age for, you know, saying that this is a, a, a adolescent or this is a tweener or whatever, but they're not really looking at the bone age. I think an adult bone age would be interesting to try to figure that out, right? Huh. Like the reverse. Like that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, any other comments? Okay, wonderful. Well, it's 7.30, so we we'll respect everyone's time. Appreciate everyone being on the call. And have a wonderful rest of the week.